Well, my initial reaction is I expected the ruling to go this way. Um, this is yet another demonstration that the opposition is living an alternate reality. Here it is, as you would recall, and your viewers would recall, the opposition felt opposed to the NRF bill and then proceeded upon a course of action unparalleled in the parliamentary history of this country. They behaved in a riotous, vulgar, and reprehensible manner. In so doing, they broke the mace and disregarded many, many admonitions from the Speaker, who is in charge of the House. And then, when they still did not get their way, and of course they danced and they blew whistles and everyone saw what happened. When they did not get their way, they walked out of the parliament and the debate proceeded to its conclusion. They then decided that rather than allow that despicable event to pass and try to do some form of damage control, they made the inexplicable decision to have it further scrutinized and further publicized and forensically examined by a tribunal like the judiciary, a decision that is unfathomable. So they came here and they asked the court essentially to confirm their vulgarity. Now, of course, they didn't, they didn't advance much legal arguments because hardly there exist any. The court rejected all their arguments and upheld our submissions. Firstly, mace or absence of mace has nothing to do with the legislative power of the parliament to make laws. Parliament is driven by the elected officials who are there, elected by the people, and is governed by the constitution. The constitution nor the standing orders make any reference to a mace. Secondly, you can't want to cause the disruption and then attempt to capitalize on that disruption for your own benefit. The law will never countenance conduct whereby one is relying upon one, one's own wrong. And that is what was happening there. The other issue is whether there was consultation in relation to the Natural Resource Fund Bill. We contended that, yes, there was consultation, widespread consultation, in the form of the time that we spent in the opposition, five years, then our manifesto, which was widely distributed and discussed across the country, elements of the Natural Resource Fund Bill are contained in our manifesto, and we led that evidence before the court. But most importantly, on the floor, where there is the debate provided for, that constitutes consultation too. But they did not uh, take the opportunity to debate. Instead, they behaved in the most reprehensible and, 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 and riotous manner. Then in any event, we question whether consultation, though desirable, is an ingredient for a successful legislative process. Consultation meaning outside of the debate. I have to see how the judge ruled on that issue because I have not read the judgment. And um, there were some other arguments that they made um, that would have allowed the court, the judiciary, to enter into the realm of the legislature to interrogate and investigate and forensically examine matters concerning the internal procedure of the parliament and the constitution by the doctrine of separation of powers as well as the doctrine of parliamentary privilege, very sacrosanct concepts 
in a democratic structure and in a constitutional democracy prohibit the trespass of one arm of government into the domain of another. In the same way that Parliament can't tell the judiciary how to determine a case that is before the judiciary, in the same manner the judiciary cannot tell Parliament how to deal with what is essentially a parliamentary matter. Whether a contempt was committed in the Parliament or in the face of the Parliament is a, it's a legislative parliamentary matter. The judiciary can pronounce. If I misbehave before a court, there is nothing that the Parliament can do if the court finds me in contempt. There are certain matters of executive government that the judiciary cannot inquire into. For example, how Parliament budgets, how the judiciary decides, to, uh, how the executive decides to budget their money, etc. So you have these clear poles of functional responsibility that are separate and apart, and one cannot trespass um, upon the upon the other. So I am happy that this is the second time in in, in recent months that. We are getting pronouncements from the court on these important issues concerning democratic governance and the constitutional preserves of the different important organs of state. It augurs well for our democracy and it's important for the development of the law and our jurisprudence. So I, I welcome the ruling. Um, the case has been dismissed and costs have been awarded. We will now have to enforce these cost orders. Um, I now have a pile of them because it's a series of cases that have been filed by the opposition, all lost, um, right from the CCJ, from the elections petition coming right down to today's ruling. So I have already asked my staff to accumulate the matters and let us begun, begin the enforcement process of getting these monies because I mean when you file these frivolous vexatious matters and the court um, expresses its displeasure in orders for costs they must be paid. Can you tell us what is that enforcement process like? Well there are many ways by which you can enforce a judgment. Here the applicants are Christopher Jones and Norris Witter so these orders are directed to them. I mean, I can, the process can seize their personal assets. I have no doubt that these persons have motor vehicles. So that's one. They can, you, you can go against their movable and immovable assets. You can go to imprison them if you can establish that they have the means to pay and they are deliberately not paying. I think that that can be established. These are, are salaried employees. And the, another process that comes to mind is that you can go to their, for example, their employers and garnish, garnish their monies that are due to them uh, monthly or as the case may be. So those are three options that are available of the cough, uh, which we will begin to explore and move swiftly on. No, they have not paid, and I, I have, um, based on, you're asking me what the, whether the if, government... Whether this opposition would have paid the, their client, their reps that brought no, no, no. against the state? No, they have not paid. I have written um, letters of demand, as I'm required to do, and um, those letters were basically ignored. So, like, for example, the case involving uh, the suspension, where eight parliamentarians sued. They owe a lot of money, and they have not paid. So we have to move in that direction now. To recover the monies? To recover the monies, yes. Another thing, sir, the President spoke about the petroleum, um, draft petroleum bill being up for the uh, public consultation from today. What could you tell us about that um, draft document? What are some of the major areas it will address? The 
draft, draft or... document was prepared by an external consultant, of course, that consultant would have received the policy directions of the government and the draft has been presented. I first have to go through that draft. I have not have an, had an opportunity to do so. It only came in, um, I believe, Friday. So I'm in the process of going through that draft to ensure that our policy directives and directions are captured and that what the government wants in the bill are there. And then I'll get back to you publicly on that.